Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by Blue Bank Resort at Real Foot Lake. Visit bluebankresort.com to start planning your weekend getaway. so much, Emily. Welcome, everyone, to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, before I introduce today's very special guest, what's something you've discovered today? It has to be today at Discovery Park of America. Something that I discovered today was that we have a Civil War garden located next to our drugstore that stands in honor of those who served what remains our nation's bloodiest conflict. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, Our special guest today is Martha Lyle Ford. She's the director of the Center for Faith and Imagination at Memphis Theological Seminary. And that's just the tip of the iceberg of what she does and has done. Her work has uh, included working with the Nature Nature Conservancy, the National Wildlife Federation, the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, Green Faith, and so much more. Welcome, Martha Lyle. Thank you so much, Scott. Glad to be here. It's great to have you here. I notice on your Twitter, one of the things that you describe yourself as a hopeful Southerner. So, <laughs> it, <laughs> so it's very nice. I'm hoping that by the time all of us get through listening to you, we are all going to be as hopeful <laughs> as I know you are. Yeah, I hadn't. I, thanks for mentioning that. I hadn't thought about that in a while. And if I can say just something about it, what I find, uh, particularly when I have lived outside of the South, is that so often Southerners are uh, stereotyped um, unfairly and that often the dominant stereotype and even sometimes the mindset that we have is uh, not hopeful or you know, despondent or I won't say despairing, but that sometimes it's easy for us to be um, stereotyped as being folks who think the glass is half empty and with a big crack in it. And that is so not, um, not only is that not my attitude, it's just not my experience. And so, yeah, hopeful Southerner. Well, I like that. And of course, we're obviously in a time of, uh, you know, where there is a lot um, of negative energy out there and a lot of uh, people mad at each other. And, you know, so um, it's nice to talk with somebody who's hopeful. Back us up a little bit. Tell us uh, where you came from, where you were born, what your childhood was like. Okay. So uh, I was born actually in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, but uh, my my dad is from Haywood County, uh, who's, you know, County seat is Brownsville, and my mom was born in Fayette County, and a little uh, community called Yum Yum. And my dad was born in a community called Providence near Holly Grove. So, um, anyway, uh, I was born in Nashville because my dad was uh, working with the government then, but moved uh, to Brownsville outside of Brownsville when I was less than a year old. So I grew up in uh, Haywood County. Um, my childhood, uh, I grew up in the, uh, I'm not ashamed to say, in the 60s and 70s, uh, born in 1962. So my childhood was one of a, uh, a privileged white um, Southerner in a small white town or in a small town. And um, so I, I mentioned all that to say that I, I grew up in a time where uh, things were sh- beginning to shift, uh, though we certainly haven't gotten there, but beginning to shift from a very segregated South to a um, more integrated South. Uh, rural community. Uh, my dad's an attorney. Um, and so uh, both my families grew up on farms. Uh, so I grew up, you know, as most folks in um the rural West Tennessee grow up surrounded by farming and most of my, uh, my cousins and relatives are involved in agriculture. There's a lot of, a lot of cotton, a lot of cotton farming, a lot of cotton, a lot of soybeans now. Yeah. 
Um, and so I guess maybe for where probably this conversation is going, um, I would characterize my childhood as, as so many of us of, of that age and growing up then as an outdoor childhood. You know, we didn't know it was outdoors. It's just that's what we did. We went out and played and rode our bikes or, um, you know, just, I don't know, built forts or sat the tree house. And um, that's important. Uh, that was, I realize now that was particularly important because it instilled in me such a, a, a connection to nature and just a wanting to be outside. And again, I'm not in any way trying to romanticize that sort of childhood. And I'm not going to be one of those who says, you know, these kids ought to get off their iPhones. But um, I know that I benefited and continue to benefit from the fact that I spent a whole lot of time outside, you know, I mean, for pleasure and also in some ways for punishment. I mean, when my mother would just be put out with me, she would say, okay, just go outside and play. You know, <laughs> so, um, so my childhood, I, I went to Haywood County Public Schools in Brownsville and um, uh, graduated from uh, high school in Memphis. Um, and yeah, then went on from there, but I uh, have moved back to Brownsville. Again, if I'm talking to West Tennesseans, you know, there's there's something about it. It just keeps it just keeps pulling you back home. Um, I've lived in Nashville, lived in Washington, D.C., uh, tried to fall in love with both, um, couldn't do it. Just something about West Tennessee, particularly the Hatchie River that keeps pulling us back. And you uh, married someone who also uh, is in the outdoor business as well. Right. Bob Ford, uh, who grew up in Memphis. Um, He is a uh, his profession is uh, he's a wildlife biologist and um, ornithologist for the Department of Interior, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, yep, and we met on a surprise, surprise, on a hike that he was leading um, in West Tennessee. Um, I had uh, been working in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill um, and just felt like that had run its course and um, had moved back home to West Tennessee, kind of licking my wounds and trying to get my bearings and uh, part of my bearings that God brought, <laughs> brought into play was, yeah, meeting Bob. And so well, see all those people that are looking for true love by swiping right. Um, mm-hmm. They need to put the phone down and go for a hike. Go outside. Absolutely. The people you, the people, my experience is the people that you meet outside on a hike, fishing, doing all those wonderful things, connecting uh, in some way to the outdoors. Uh, man, for the most part, those are good folks. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. So what what was your major and where did you say you went to college? I went to Vanderbilt um, uh, and my major was communication. Uh, really at that point thought I wanted to be a uh, broadcast journalist uh, you'll remember Jane Pauley on the Today Show. I wanted sure. to be Jane Pauley. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was my undergraduate degree. And um, when I was working, uh, I worked for Senator Al Gore and you know, when he was a senator, I actually started working for him when he was a congressman and worked in his um, press uh, department. And then I got my, uh, also went back to Vanderbilt for my master's, my uh, master's of divinity. Which uh, is uh, uh, obviously faith based. And, you know, uh, how did that, at what point did you sort of shift gears from journalism into both faith based work and environmentalism? Yeah. Uh, Well, I mentioned that I had been working in Washington, D.C., and um, working in media. And that was uh, even back when media was uh, less contentious and, um, ugly uh, than it is now. But it beat me up pretty good. Um, I realized after five and a half years in that environment that it was not, uh, at that time, I would say it was not what I was cut out to do. I just didn't have whatever you have to have, you know, internally to, to really be successful and be healthy at that. So I um, moved home 
And like I said, it was just sort of trying to sort things out. Um, I was diagnosed at that point with clinical depression, which is something that um, I'm really grateful that people openly share now because every family that I know is touched in some way by someone who deals with depression. And it wasn't that long ago that it was the sort of thing that you didn't really talk about. You just kind of whispered. But I was diagnosed with depression and um, it was triggered uh, by stress and a a life that was pretty out of balance, working too hard, not rested enough, um, not really taking good care of myself. And it was at that point that all of these things kind of came together. Uh, I was back home and um, I found that I I found my greatest peace and sense of solace and comfort and well-being when I was out um, either hiking or sitting on a, you know, on the bank of a lake or um, riding a horse or just just being outside. I, in some ways, it might sound cliche or corny, but I really found my restoration um, in nature. And more specifically, I found that I, cre- I, I connected to God, to Creator, in a way when I was outdoors on a deeply spiritual level in a way that at that point I really wasn't uh, through other forms of worship. You know, there was something about sort of the sanctuary and the um, the peace and uh, beauty of nature and experiencing God as creator that really began to, um, to deepen my sense of a devotion and understanding of relationship to God, as well as really helped, um, helped me get over and get through my depression. I mean, I also, you know, um, took medication and the other things that you do to get through depression. But uh, so those, I guess it really was at that point um, that it all began to come together. And I, during that time, um, I'm an avid reader and, and a, kind of a wannabe academic, I guess. Um, so I was reading a lot of theology and um, a lot of scripture. And I read an article by a professor uh, whose name is Dr. Sally McFaig. And um, she was at Vanderbilt Divinity School. And of course, I'd gone to Vanderbilt as an undergraduate And she is now known as one of the first eco-theologians. She was one of the first people who was really talking about, or again, uh, focusing on the importance of connecting to creator through creation. And it really spoke to me. And I want to be real quick to say that as as I talk about caring for creation or eco-theology, I'm in no way putting the creation above the creator. (laughs) That's a really important distinction. Um, Which, you know, what's interesting is a lot of times when people think about faith and church, they think about a brick or wood building that you have to go into and sit on a pew, you know? And so I love, I think it was on your Facebook page. I saw, uh, you know, an illustration of that, that basically, you know, had God with the church, you know, inside one of the letters. Anyway, it's, uh, I think that's really, really powerful. Yeah. Well, that has, that is one of the ways that I, um, most, uh, I guess, express and connect to, um, God. And, and that's not to say that it's the only way. And it's not to say that, uh, that the church as a community of, of people or that the church is an institution and as bricks and mortar, that that's not important. It is, it's, it's desperately important. But for me personally, and what I found is for a lot of people, supplementing that or having all of that built on the foundation of acknowledging God as creator, you know, I mean, the very first 
words of the Bible are, you know, a garden. And the very first, well, not the very first, but one of the first commandments that God gave us in Genesis 2.15 is to tend and keep the garden. Now, before that, God told us to be fruitful and multiply. Man, we are knocking that one out of the park. But and and so again, I just I want to emphasize I'm not saying that creator is more important. I mean that creation is more important. Let me be clear. Uh, I have had people say, well, do you worship, you know, do you worship trees? Do you worship creation? I was like, no, I worship the God who created all of that and who created all of that even before we were created. And, the, and I worship the God who entrusted us with the care of um, that, uh, the God who says, tend and keep my garden. And um, I worship the God who um, gifted and continues to gift us with all of the bounty and the beauty. So I don't want to go off preaching, but that's... <laughs> Well, um, and, and you did get a, a degree in uh, theology, so you, right, you're welcome so, to preach. Right. Take well, us to church. <laughs> and and Sally McFaig's article uh, launched me to go to Vanderbilt Divinity School. And never in my life would I have thought that I would go to Divinity School. Um, although I, there are a lot of preachers on I think both sides of my family, both the Walker side, which is my mother's side, and the Reed side, which is my dad's side. Um, but I had, had not planned on going to divinity school, to seminary, but I was so intrigued. And also having uh, worked um, in Washington and having worked particularly with Senator Gore and his uh, knowledge of and concern for the environment and, um, you know, the then uh, just the very, very, very first notions of um, um, climate change. Uh, I was particularly and, and having grown up, you know, really connected to and loving nature and, and being surrounded by folks who make their living uh, you know, as farmers, I mean, that's, that's making your living from nature. <laughs> so uh, my whole life was just, you know, really um, immersed with this. And I was so intrigued uh, by the article. I really wasn't sure what I was going to do with next. And I felt like, and had the, had the privilege really of going um, and studying uh there at Vanderbilt Divinity, took as many classes from Dr. McFaig as, as I could. And it's, it's fascinating to me that, uh, this article literally changed the whole direction of your life, which is what Discovery Park of America is all about and you know, inspiring children and adults to see beyond. You literally got inspired to change your whole direction of your life, uh, by this article. Absolutely. Of course, I didn't know it at the time, but on some level, um, that article, that, that, those words, that information, that experience entered me in a way that just something, things just kind of came together. I mean, it wasn't, you know, like the cartoon where it's like, aha, Eureka, but it, it, it made sense in a way that I couldn't really explain, but I really, really wanted to go learn more about. Yeah. And so, so, and so, um, you're, you've been able to currently, you have a position that combines a lot of your interests. So we're going to talk about your, uh, we're going to talk about the, the doctorate you're working on in just a minute, but, um, in your position as, uh, at the Memphis Theological Seminary, you are the director of the Center for Faith, which I get, and Imagination, yeah. which, <laughs> uh, is fascinating to me. So how do those two things merge together? Yeah, we, um, we, uh, n named the center that very intentionally and actually to kind of get that same sort of not reaction, but to intrigue people because, um, the purpose of the center is to help ministers, whether they be ordained clergy or lay folks, um, to help ministers thrive in ministry, um, 
I'll give you a little bit of the backstory of, of the center and, and that will help answer the question. The burnout rate for clergy is, uh, it's distressing. Uh, seven years into ministry after seminary, uh, the burnout rate, the um, resignation rate is just, I, I don't want to quote fact, I mean, figures because I'll undoubtedly get them wrong, but it's, it's alarming. And um, a lot of that, I mean, there are a lot of factors and certainly the pandemic and the last couple of years have exacerbated that trend. And as a but preacher's the, kid, I can I can uh, understand anecdotally what you're talking about. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, you could. <laughs> uh, you we should talk offline about that. I didn't realize <laughs> that about you, but um, yeah. And so the Center for Faith and Imagination is one of um, about a hundred programs uh, across the country that's funded by the Lilly Endowment. Um, to come up with ways to implement programs uh, to help ministers not just survive, but thrive. And so one of the ways uh, as we were, we uh, at the Memphis Seminary were envisioning the work of the center, we didn't want to just call it the Center for Pastoral Leadership or the Center for Pastoral Support. Because, and this, this goes back to something that you just said, the imagination, um, each individual's imagination is critical to their thriving. Um, so often we, we, external factors, you know, drag us down. But I think so often it's also our lack of being able to or being willing to see beyond the box or the prescribed role, or the meeting the expectations, that we really have to engage the imagination that God gives us about how to do things uh, maybe in a new or better or more sustainable way. And um, imagination also involves arts, and it involves, you know, the, that connection to creation, and it involves um you know, imagination in to me is just this great um, sort of undefinable uh, life giving thing. And so faith and imagination kind of opened the door for us to go in a lot of the healthy and supportive directions that we wanted to go. And one of those, uh, a new program that we're, we'll be offering are called uh, Renewal in Nature Retreats. Uh, that I'll be leading uh, starting in January. And the focus will be on uh, Sabbath keeping and on uh, nature as spiritual practice. Uh, Sabbath keeping, not just obeying the, you know, the fourth commandment, um, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, which so often we equate with, be sure you go to church. Um Sabbath is rest and Sabbath, uh, the, the Hebrew word, one of the Hebrew words translated in, in the story about Sabbath or the commands of Sabbath is minua, which is M-E-N-U-H-A. And minua actually means delight and uh, relationship uh, with others and with God and with creation. And so the way these retreats will focus on Sabbath keeping is not just, like I said, you know, take a day off to get all your housework done or your yard work done, but Sabbath as the holy time set aside to rest, truly rest, and to delight in relationship uh, with God, uh, with others, with creation which is really what the Sabbath, uh, my understanding, my reading of uh, the creation story is. I mean, on the seventh day, I grew up with this vision that, you know, God created everything. And on the seventh day, God was so worn out, even though God is omnipotent, that God just kind of, you know, was exhausted and didn't do anything. But again, as I've um, 
learned more and read more and and imagined more, uh, Sabbath is uh, God rested because God had created everything, but also God delighted in what God had made. And it was in perfect balance. It was as it should be. It was in right relationship. And so these retreats will uh, take an approach to Sabbath keeping in that way. And what what will take place on these retreats? Well, um, there'll be overnight retreats and um, there will be uh, group discussions about just some of the ideas that I've just put out. Some uh, we will spend some time looking particularly at scriptures at some, uh, there's some wonderful writings uh, by recent theologians and ministers uh, all across the spectrum. I mean, from, you know, progressive or liberal to conservative to middle of the road. I mean, it, it's been really fun uh, looking into all the different writings about Sabbath. So th- reviewing, looking at, reading uh, some of those, we'll have um, time spent outside. Um, one of the other practices, in addition to Sabbath keeping that we'll be focusing on, uh, will be nature as spiritual practice, meaning um, it, it sounds kind of funny, but really for a lot of us, it's very, very difficult to just sit and be still and be aware um, to really notice when, particularly when you're sitting outside with, with no um, electronic distractions, uh, to really be aware of, uh, breath and air and sounds and what it feels like to be still, you know, again, one of my mom's favorite, um, scriptures. And I I have to, I have to, with a whole lot of my, um, that, kind of unspoken connection to nature. Um, she gets it in a way that not very few peop- other people that I've ever met get it. Um, but one of her favorite scriptures uh, is be still and know that I'm God. And to do that outside in a way that is really attuning yourself to uh, the creation that God placed us in it kind of doesn't seem like we ought to have to go on retreats to learn how to do that. But the truth of the matter is we do. And maybe even if we know how to do it, we need to, I don't know, it's like we need to be given permission to do it, encouraged to do it. And especially folks, uh, well, I can, uh, since I work with ministers, I, I can only speak to that group of professionals, but it's hard for ministers to sit still and just be still. And well, we're just, we're inundated by opportunities not to. The other day I realized I was laying on the couch watching TV with my laptop was on my stomach and I was holding my phone. And I thought, this is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, so I just turned everything off for a minute and just walked around and played with my dog. Um, it's yeah, just, exactly. uh, <laughs> it's, it is tough. And honestly, that's, it's so it's so awesome to hear you talking about this. That is my, one of my new year's resolutions is to be more purposeful about having moments like that where I hear and smell and see nature. And yeah, I mean, and connecting with your dog is one of the best ways that we do it. I think that's one reason that we just, you know, we love our pets is, I mean, partly it's because they're always glad to see us. At least dogs are. I mean, I don't know about cats, but um, you know, they're just, I mean, they're one of God's creatures that connects with us and loves us. And we, and we can see, um, it is, I mean, hanging out with your dog is also connecting to creation in my way of viewing things. And, and again, in no way do I mean, this is not about guilting people about being online. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I am very much, our internet is, is still down from the storms recently and, you know, I've just been in a real snit about it. So it's not about guilt or any of that. It's just, it's really an opportunity to uh, reconnect with something that is so deep inside of us. I mean, we are, 
uh, my, my understanding and certainly my experience is we are deeply connected uh, to creation, whether it be sitting at the bird, you know, sitting and looking at the bird feeder out your window or playing with your dog or taking a hike or fishing or sitting in a duck blind or uh, it's not like you have to uh, be the stereotypical tree hugger. You know, I mean, it's, it's just being aware uh, and a lot of it really is awareness, which is what most spiritual disciplines are. It's, it's a, uh, it's an awareness of that, which is beyond yourself and that, that, which is divine, that, that, which is of God. Yeah. So. We have uh discovery park has a chapter of the Tennessee naturalist program. <sighs> Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah. And so I, I did at the end of last year, we have awesome. a whole nother class going on right now. And honestly, it was one of the best things I did last year. The class portion, you know, was important and was <sighs> helpful, but I loved getting out at Real mm-hmm. Foot Lake and walking around and learning about, you know, it really helped me become more purposeful about what is it that I'm looking at, you know, in yeah. the woods. So yeah, yeah it was really good. I have, uh, I'm glad to know that that's, that y'all are uh, hosting that. That's one of the things that I have, um, that I want to do. I really want to participate. I have um, quite a few colleagues who have gone through both uh, that program and also the Master Gardener program. You know, that's just, uh, those are both really great programs. Yeah, we're working on a, a greenhouse for a big education greenhouse for next year. And so the Master Gardener program folks have been working with us on that as well. So, so cool. Yeah, you yeah. Need, to, and you again, need to get over here to discover. I, do. I know. I do. I do. <laughs> yeah. And, and you just mentioning a greenhouse, you know, um, tending plants. I mean, this, again, it sounds kind of, well, oh, I don't know. Sometimes when I, hear myself saying these things, I think, oh, oh, but really and truly, you know, tending your plants and um, that is part of caring for God's creation. And I think especially for me, when I do those things, it's not just the doing them, but, and, and when I do those and um, engage my awareness that this is, um, that this is a gift from God, everything uh, all, all that is created by God, um, you know, it's it's a gift to us. And I think one of one of the things that uh, when we get so distracted and so um, busy, even do busy doing very good things, is that we just uh, it's so easy to forget that the creation and and all every bite of food that we take came from the creation one way or another. Well, no way. I don't know about cheese whiz. Cause I don't really know if there's anything <laughs> natural in cheese whiz, but no, I don't think there is, <laughs> but you think about it. And that's, you know, that's why we say grace or say a blessing. Thank you for this food and the hands that, that brought it all the way from whether it be the sea or the ranch or the garden or the, the farm, Every set of hands that brought it, it comes from God's earth. One way or the other, it started um, as part of creation. And You're clearly navigating multiple areas of uh, today's political, popular, whatever you want to say, culture. Um, mm-hmm. Every topic is kind of a hot button. We've got a culture war and a transition going on in the faith communities. Yeah. Um, how are you navigating that? And how do you advise the ministers that you work with to navigate that very difficult wow. world we're in right now? Well, <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a heavy question. Uh, pray a lot. <laughs> Pray a lot. Well, uh, from the perspective of the Center for Faith and Imagination, one of our first, uh, I mean, our our purpose uh, is, again, to help ministers thrive. And so self-care in all of its forms is is absolutely necessary. And like you said, particularly in these very contentious and too often ugly times, um, you know, I'm just, I'm ready, way past ready for people to be kind. You know, even if, when, not even if, when you disagree, be kind, be civil, be respectful. 
Um, so anyway, that's a whole nother line. So um, I think we we seek to we don't you know the Center for Faith and Imagination is is made up of and um, works with loves and supports uh, ministers again the whole spectrum um, all across and and that is not uh, you know. That's, that's not even part of really the conversation. Um, Memphis Seminary has students and uh, alums from more than 25 denominations. It is affiliated with the um, Cumberland Presbyterian denomination. Um, uh, but uh, it's we work across the spectrum. Um, I think that uh, from from my particular little uh, my, the lens through which I see uh, the work, caring for creation, however you define that, uh, once once a person looks into themselves and uh, reads scripture and uh, spends time in study and prayer. However, a person is led to care for creation. That's how they're led. I mean, that's not. That's not my job. That's you know. That's God. That's between that individual and God and spirit. Um, my my opportunity is to help people um, revisit that connection to be mindful of uh, some of those key scriptures that we were called to tend to keep the earth, um, that the scripture that um, is translated as dominion uh, is, is not about dominating, uh, again, in the original language, um, that it is about uh, having dominion as a benevolent king would. So, um, you know, Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. So my opportunity, um, and I feel like what I'm called to do is to engage folks in conversation, but also to encourage them to engage their imagination and to encourage them to be in conversation with others and with, uh, God, however they do that, uh, to find out how they're being led, in what way, on what level um, they are being led to care for creation. Caring for creation is everything from changing your light bulbs, you know, to the swirly bulbs or the uh, to planting a garden, you know, growing some of your own food. I mean, it can also mean, you know, participating in a climate march, but it can, it can also mean, um, buying things that are, you know, involve less packaging. It's, it's there. It, however, God is calling someone to be involved in tending and keeping the garden. I love That's that. That's what I'm interested in. And it's interesting, uh, to, uh, hear more about, I'm interested in hearing more about your, uh, doctor that you're working on. So we're going to do that when we get back from the break. But before we go to break, will you tell us a little bit about the house you live in and the work that you guys have been doing? Every time I drive to Memphis, I go the way where I pass by your house. I always honk and wave. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. I, I love your house. And full disclosure, um, we were talking earlier before we actually started. Um, my grandparents uh, lived across the street from your grandparents, and my grandfather was the nephew of your grandmother, uh, Joe Reed. And so, anyway, our families We're are, kin, Scott, yeah, and, yeah. and I'm proud to claim you. I hope you feel the same. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, when so, you say they lived across the street, it was a little country road. It, it was a road. <laughs> yeah. There were no yeah. streetlights. There were no lines. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, and my grandmother, uh, Elizabeth... Uh, Castellaw Williams and your grandmother, Joe Reed, used to take me fishing in the summer times. And I very clearly remember uh, they would always use Catfish Charlie and they would always think it was oh so my gosh. funny. They would make me smell it. They thought that was so funny. Um, oh, I love that. I've never yeah. heard that. 
yeah, I have a snapshot in my head of the times going fishing with them on a, a pond bank. So, well, before we go to the break, I know we have to, but let me tell you my fishing story with my grandmother, and it didn't involve your uh, your grandmother, but um, my grandmother would have us uh, fish for worms. <laughs> so that she could go fishing. And I don't know, some <laughs> folks might know this. You know, you take a broom straw and you stick it down in the hole where the worm is and and hopefully it'll be annoyed and latch onto it and you pull it out and so you've got a fishing <laughs> worm. And I was not ever very successful. And now I have wondered if she actually thought we were going to catch worms or if that was just a way to occupy us. And again, outside, I remember doing that. I remember the smell of the pine mm. trees. I remember, you know, the squishy ground under my feet while I was fishing for worms. So, yeah. yeah you and I are about the same age. Um, and I remember, you know, my grandparents had across the road, they sat outside in those Southern mm-hmm. lawn chairs around there. Uh, they had a bird bath that yeah. had a cupid on it, and they sat Absolutely. out there all the time. And sometimes your grandparents would walk across the road, mm-hmm. you know, and sit there. And so, anyway, tell us a yeah. little bit about your house you're working on or have been for years. Okay. So, um, like I said, we have uh, Bob and I and our two daughters have bounced back and forth between the DC area and uh, Brownsville a couple of times. Um, Bob's work is, uh, he's ba- he's still based out of the Washington, D.C. area, though he has been home um, since the federal offices have been closed because of COVID back in 2020. Um, so when we moved back to Brownsville, I don't know, 16 years ago, uh, we kind of wanted to be out in the country, but kind of wanted to be in town. So we, we bought a house that uh, was not no one in our either of our families um, had lived in the house. It's just a big old farmhouse um, built, I'm not exactly sure when, but the early 1900s. And like any old house, you know, it's we have kind of a love-hate relationship with it. Um, uh, love the character, love the feel, love the spirit of it, love the high ceilings. Hate that not a single window is you know, standard size, you know, I hate that there's that slope and roll to the original floors. But we, um, when we first bought the house, I really wanted to, uh, to explore the possibility of going solar um, and did some research into that. And unfortunately, and this is the case for almost everybody I know, it was just cost prohibitive. We could not afford the upfront cost, even though, you know, the, uh, you're going to recoup um, over the long haul. But I mean, we didn't have that kind of upfront money to put into it. Um, so since we weren't able to do that, we and it is an old house, we've just done kind of everything that we could do very, very gradually um, in terms of, you know, insulation, um, we we needed more space, so we turned the attic into uh, some bedrooms uh, for the daughters because once they got to you know be a certain age, living sharing a room was maybe not best for their relationship. <laughs> so anyway, um, so when we did that, we did that as energy energy efficiently as possible. Um, we had a pond dug. Uh, so that we could fish, but also, um, you know, wildlife. Uh, it, right behind our house is a 40-acre uh, agricultural field. And so we've, we've tried to sort of uh, put, it, put back some fence rows. Uh, I know so many hunters who really long for, you know, quail. Um, you know, you know, people who remember having lots of quail and rabbits and such. I mean, not the only reason, but one of the reasons we have less of those around is because we don't have as many fence rows. We don't have as many places for them. So we've just tried to um, incorporate some fence rows, some brush piles, um, like I said, the pond, just little by little. Um, and you've also incorporated music. Uh, into oh uh, yes, into, or yes. You were I don't know if you yeah. started to back up. Well, again. we ha- we haven't. Uh, we had we host house concerts um, called Faith Hope Love House Concerts, where we um, 
find and invite uh, singer songwriters, uh, you know, often from the Memphis area, Nashville area. We have folks come from Texas, Louisiana, uh, North Carolina. Um, a lot of times when we find folks that we're able to book them as they are on their way to Memphis or Austin, Texas. And we host, um, we just host them for an evening in our living room. Uh, my husband is uh, is a musician. He would say he's not, but he plays the guitar. Uh, is a beautiful voice. Plays the banjo. Uh, was you know in a bluegrass band in college, and and so he um, he is a musician. I'm and I'm a lover of music, particularly live acoustic original music, and that has been one of the most fun things that we've done. Um, and it's, uh, they are concerts, you know, you, we ask people, it's not required, but we ask people to contribute to put some money in the cigar box. And, um, we guarantee the singer songwriter a certain amount and they get everything that's in the cigar box. And, um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to hear some really great, musicians playing in your living room. I have to say, we've had a couple of folks who were on their way up um, when we were able to have them. Uh, a young woman named Caroline Jones, um, she played in our house a couple of times. She's the niece of a friend and she is now playing with the Zac Brown band and she opened for Jimmy Buffett for a while. So, you know, and um there are so many great musicians just a stone's throw from where you and I are. And yeah, we're very, we're very blessed. I hope that I'm still on your uh, mailing list. You are. Well, and today. one of our, one of our resolutions for 2022 is to, to get them started back. Um, hoping That's that people are, you know, vaccinated or masked or or safe just respectful yeah, yeah. No, that's great we're going to take a quick break when we get back we're going to talk a little bit about your doctorate thanks if you have not yet experienced blue bank resort with its tasty catfish handcrafted beers and wide porch and patio on real foot lake then you need to start booking your trip now blue bank resort is one of the best spots for dining cocktails live music and gorgeous sunsets visit bluebankresort.com for more information I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to go and subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review for us on iTunes, Spotify, or your podcast catcher of choice. That's how we let more people know the great things going on here in West Tennessee. Our guest today is Martha Lyle Ford, Director of the Center for Faith and Imagination at Memphis Theological Seminary. Um, I've had a blast talking to you so far. Now I'm excited to hear you tell us a little bit more about your, I'm going to have to read this. You're working on your doctor of ministry in land, food, and faith formation with a focus on environmental justice and creation care. Did I say that yeah, right? That's a mouthful. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no wonder it's taken me so long to get it done. <laughs> I should get at least some kind of a degree for being able to say it. You're, yes. You at least get a big gold star. Um, yeah. So uh, the doctorate is a doctor of ministry, um, which is a, a degree offered through Memphis seminary. Um, and it is a, it's, it's different from a PhD in that it is a very practical application degree, kind of like a, a, a doctor of, edu uh, I guess a doctor of education is, is a, yeah, again, a practical application. You're, um, we're not just studying the topic, we're studying the topic, developing a project to hopefully address some challenge or issue implementing the project, looking at the results, and then writing about the results. So, and mine is about, um, it, it's uh, the Renewal in Nature retreats that I talked about earlier are the project for my doctorate. Um, I'll be taking a look at um, how, let's see, the 
the benefits, uh, hopefully they're benefits, but the benefits that clergy experience um, after participating in a retreat, a renewal in nature retreat, and um, their understanding of Sabbath and nature as spiritual practice. And that wasn't really probably very clarifying, but <clears throat> basically I'm taking a lot of what we've been talking about, this uh, understanding of uh, the benefits of connecting to um, creation or nature, however you do that, whatever that means to you, and um, looking at how that um, benefits health, um, emotion, relationship, uh, spiritual life of ministers who participate in these retreats. And you're um, obviously writing a, a thesis or paper, yeah, whatever you call yeah. it. Big oh, paper is what I call it. The big paper. <laughs> yeah. right. Yes. Which um, will, uh, you know, be bound and, um, at least put on the shelf in Memphis Theological Seminary. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, the program, Land, Food, and Faith Formation. Um, it, this is, I'm in the first cohort to, to go through this program. It was actually, I uh, was privileged to be able to help develop it in part because of my interest um, in the field. And there really aren't any other programs um, in the country that focus on this. Um, it's the intersection of creation care, the scriptural and theological call to be uh, tenders and keepers of creation, um, intersection of that and uh, land, how we use the land. And because we're based in Memphis, uh, you know, an agricultural center, we have a real emphasis on agriculture and food production. And so sort of where those three lines come together, um, how we use the land can mean anything. Yeah. I, I mean, it can mean anything um, from uh, some people who are involved in this kind of work um, and land use think about planning. You know, how do we plan a town? Like with Blue Oval City coming to West Tennessee, how are we going to uh, how are we going to plan the use of that land? Some people see that uh, uh, land use as um, you know pollution or our particular focus and the particular focus of my program is more on food production and how that intersects with our call to be good stewards of the earth, both in how we use the land, but also how food is the actual production of food um, and how food is uh, distributed, um, who has access to good food. You know, it's no, it's no secret that there are a lot of hungry people in West Tennessee. And um, as a person of faith, I have to ask myself, okay, we live in, a, in a, a region that is known for its agricultural abundance. We pride ourselves. We work hard. We produce good stuff. And yet we have so many hungry people. And, and at the same time, we have, there are so many people who are, um, uh, childhood obesity is a real problem in rural West Tennessee. So how do all these things, how do we make sense of this? And as a person of faith, as a person who is seeking to live into God's call uh, on my life to tend and keep the earth, what is my role in that? Um, and how we produce food, um, how does that inform my faith, and how do I, you know, when Jesus, uh, when the young lawyer asked Jesus, basically, what do I have to do to have eternal life, and Jesus said, well, you know, you're the, you're, you know the law, you tell me, and, and the young lawyer said, I'm to love God, love my neighbor, um, and, you know, love my neighbor as myself. And Jesus said, you're right. You know what you're supposed to do. Go and do it. And then that leads straight into the story about the Good Samaritan, where we are taught 
who our neighbors are. So looking at it through that lens as a person of faith, how am I loving God and loving my neighbor? Um, or how are we as people of faith showing love for God and love for neighbor in our production and distribution of food and in the ways that we care and tend the earth? So those are the questions that I and my colleagues in this particular degree are looking at. And um Lots of interesting conversations and fascinating readings. And uh, we have students from Arkansas and a couple from Texas and all across Tennessee and Mississippi. And um, it's been a very rich two and a half years of courses. And now I just I just got to get this paper written. <laughs> <laughs> You've just written a book. So, you know, you know, yeah. the discipline of writing and it's hard. It's yeah, hard. It, it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of time and it's not, you just don't sit down and do it. No. Everything's got to come together. And there's so many other things, you know, <laughs> to be doing or another article to read or another person to talk to. I mean, so. So I have, I have no doubt that we have sparked some inspiration um, in some people today. What do you recommend for people for whom this has been uh, of great interest who want to find out more. Where, How can they get involved? How can they educate themselves further on these topics? So if, if you're interested in the work of creation care um, from a sort of a faith perspective, um, virtually every denomination has some resources and you can Google your denomination um, I'm on the uh, uh, committee um, for the United Methodist denomination and here in West Tennessee and Western Kentucky. Um, so if your denomination doesn't or if that's not, yeah, you can certainly uh, just go to uh, the Methodist website and Google creation care Um if your interest is more what people would call environmentalism, which to me is the same thing. It's just, that's a different, that's a more secular word. And for a lot of people, a much more political way of saying it for me, it's about caring for God's creation again, in whatever way God is calling you to do that. But, you know, they're one of the, uh, uh, you can just Google, um, Let's see, what would I do? A couple of organizations. Uh, there's one uh, called Draw Down, D R A W D O W N dot org. Um, that is a great, uh, it's a great um, website. Um, you know, let's see, I'm kind of going blank because most of my resources are faith based. Um, one of, and, and my particular faith is Christian faith. Although, um, um, all the other, um, uh, all the other faiths also have resources. Um, let's say green faith, G R E E N F A I T H dot org, um, is an interfaith international organization that I worked for, for a while. Um, they have incredible resources, um, or, you know, email me. I'd love to be in conversation. Um, uh, and I can be emailed through the through Memphis Seminary. It's uh, mlford at memphisseminary.edu. And also the Memphis Seminary website. We have a link to a lot of a lot of resources, both on um what we've been talking about, uh, clergy care, thriving in ministry, totally apart. You know, we have resources totally apart from creation care. Creation care is, is just one of the ways that we are working with clergy um, to help them thrive. And um, we'll put link, we'll put links and your email address in the show notes for anybody who wants to go and find more information. This has been really fascinating. Okay. Uh, I'm really I'm grateful. So glad. Yeah. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about it. It's, uh, it is, uh, like I said, it's a passion. Um, it is, uh, I mean, it, as you know, and as your listeners are going to know, the, 
um, what sparks your imagination is what kind of brings you to life. And it's, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to talk to folks and seriously would, would welcome the opportunity to engage or I'm pretty sure there are things that I either misstated or did not uh, clarify. And, you know, I, I would welcome opportunities to be in conversation wherever you are uh, about it. Um, Really be interested in being in conversation about it. Well, and Um, and when you publish your thesis as a book, we'll have the book signing (laughs) party here at Discovery Park of America. All right. All right. Y'all all all pray about that, okay? (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Well, thank you. And thank you to all of our listeners who've joined us uh, today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. 